I invite you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. We will pick up where we left off last week. We are engaged in verses 27 through 30. I'm not going to spend much time in review, so if you're new today, we'll try to give you enough so it sort of sets the framework for where we are, but uh, we need to have enough time to be able to share and celebrate together in communion at the end of the sermon, so let me get right after it. We're engaged in a series uh, called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. The Bible has a lot to say about laughter. That's the outward expression of an inward joy. And uh, we spent several weeks looking at uh, how laughter is important to us. It's healthy for us, by the way. Uh, People live longer when they laugh. Uh, Another interesting statistic I just found out about church attendance. People who are regular church tenders live seven and a half years longer than folks who don't. That's pretty good, huh? So, if we can laugh and go to church. Wow! All right, that is a dynamite mixture, all right? Uh, But anyway, we're looking right now at the inward reality of the outward expression, and that is a subject of joy. We're focusing our attention on the book of joy out of the Bible, and it's the book of Philippians. And what gives added punch to our study of the book of Philippians as every chapter is filled with the subject of joy is that we know that the author of the book of Philippians was Paul, and Paul was incarcerated. He was under house arrest at the time that he wrote this. So no, he was not in a prison, but he was a prisoner in a house chained both arms to a guard 24-7. And he writes about the subject of joy and contentment in those circumstances. And so we have been looking at over the past few weeks how joy functions in the midst of our adversity and what the benefits are in our lives as we have joy while we go through adverse circumstances. And we're looking now at the wrap-up to chapter 1 in these closing verses. Follow along, if you will, with me while we read. Whatever happens, what is left out of that word? Good answer. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Whatever happens, we could say it another way, regardless of your circumstances, doesn't matter. So what's coming next is to be applied to our lives as believers in Jesus Christ Whatever happens. In Dick Kelton's life, at the moment, the whatever happens is uncertainty about what he's going through. In Derek Burns' life, at 22 years of age, whatever happens. For the Sullivan family and what you've been through, you've seen the reality in whatever happens. The next words are for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and I see you myself or whether I'm absent from you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, contending as one person, For the faith of the gospel. This is written to the church. He's talking to them collectively and he's making it singular. It's just like marriage too. Become one. The fellowship of believers. A congregation moves as one. I don't want you to be frightened in any way. By those who oppose you or by those things that oppose you. This is a sign Those things will be destroyed, but you will be saved. And that salvation comes from God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Oh, don't we wish that last part of that verse was not written. Since you're going through the same struggles you saw that I had, and you now hear that I have. Whatever happens. Some translations take that passage and say, only Conduct yourselves in a manner. So, in life, period. Only conduct yourselves in a manner that expresses the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking 
at three priorities for victory in a life that is faced with adversity. And last week what we did is we highlighted the prerequisites to those three priorities for victory in a life that faces adversity. And those, those three prerequisites were understanding this word, whatever happens. The word sometimes translated only in the amplified version, above all, uh, uh, nothing else. Conduct yourselves. In other words, this is the only thing you and I should focus on in whatever happens in our life is the person of Jesus Christ. The, the second key word for having a life of victory in the midst of adversity is the word worthy. That word worthy we think is something that we earn. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not worthy of your trust because I have failed you. You're not worthy of a compliment because you didn't do anything worth complimenting. You're not worthy of the raise because your performance hasn't measured up. That's not this word. This word worthy, as we looked at last week, is to balance your life. It's the same thing of a balancing beam. Someone who walks a tightrope. It's easier when you've got something to balance with. If you've ever crossed a log over a stream, you want to stay balanced. You know, if you've got a backpack on and it slips off to one side, where are you going? Yeah, yeah, you're going in the stream. But we need this thing to balance us. It refers to balancing the scale so both sides are even and we can walk consistently. The balance beam for us as Christians is the Word of God. The balance beam is not our circumstances. The balance beam is not our personality. The balance beam is not our abilities or our gifts. The balance beam is God's precious Word. And the third key word before we look at these three priorities, is the word conduct. Conduct your lives. It was the most unusual word that Paul used here. Very different than in other books when he used the word conduct yourselves worthy. It's a completely different word. This is a word that literally means uh, from the city. It's where we get our word politics from. It's where we get our word police from. And uh, the connection here is, is that you are to live worthy of your home. The Philippians would understand this. They would make the connections because they were Roman citizens, but they were 800 miles away from Rome. Paul was a Roman citizen. That's why he was in Rome awaiting trial. He didn't get tried in the hometown. He was a Roman citizen. He deserved the privilege of being tried in Rome. So what Paul is telling those Philippian believers is, hey, live worthy of where your home is. Where's your home? I have an address on earth that's 529 West Athens. That's not my home. That is my residence while on earth. My home is in heaven. Dan's already seen my home. I'm kind of ticked off about that. He gets to see it before I do. There's a song I grew up, my parents' generation song. I hadn't thought about it until the last service, and I hope I can remember the words this time. I had to get it started. So it says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, Dodgers must be up there. Somewhere <laughs> beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open doors, and I cannot and I will not feel at home in this world anymore. That is a balance beam for us because it's the Word of God telling us this world is always going to have its rough moments and you need a balance beam so that you conduct yourselves worthy of your residence which is in heaven. You and I are to be the world's taste of heaven on earth. They are to see that in the lives of the Christians so that when we experience adversity, they realize that heaven wins out. And oh my, did we see that in Dan's life these last several weeks. So with these three key words in mind, conduct, worthy, and only, we then wrapped up last week with a reminder of who we are as Christians. 
I kind of rushed through it, so I'm going to highlight it again. Neil Anderson did a beautiful job putting it together many years ago in his first book called, uh, uh, it was either Overcoming the Darkness or Victory Over the Darkness, and it's been in every book that he's written since then. And you can go online, you don't even have to buy the book if you want to Google Neil Anderson, Who I Am in Christ, the page will pop up for you, and you can print it out. Put it in your Bible somewhere. Put it in a place that you see often because this is important. I will tell you, after this service last Sunday, a lady came up to me that had not been in church in a while. And she said, I was prepared to ask you after church, what does God think of me? And you answered the question with this, this reading of who I am in Christ. It's important. It's important that we not only know, but then we remember. And so put this someplace. Memorize some of these scriptures that are recorded on here. There are three things that he outlines for us. Number one, I am accepted in Christ. Isn't that a primary need that we have is acceptance? Anybody here love rejection? Never been, I've never been a fan of it, all right? I sometimes have done stupid things in order to be accepted. I suspect you probably have too at some point in your life. Here's the deal. We don't have to do a stupid thing to be accepted by God. We have to do a wise thing. Admit we are sinners in need of a Savior and invite Him to come live in our life. And when we are, here's what's true about us. I am God's child. If you weren't at the service yesterday for Dan, you didn't hear this, but, but, but one of the things that Dan wanted to be known by, it's what his family sent to me. This, they had this conversation. Dan was 6'5". Most of you knew that, all right? He didn't look 6'5 sitting down over there, all right? But when I got in that baptistry with him, and we showed the video yesterday at the service, God, God I hate him, okay? It's like this. And then in the baptistry, he had the nerve, all right, to laugh at me. And then, while I'm in a very serious moment, my hand on his back, my, heavens lift, my hands lifted towards heaven, and I'm saying, and now I have the privilege of baptizing you, my brother. He does this. <laughs> but he wanted to be known as a child of God. Not a stud police officer. Not a great husband or dad, and he was all of those. But his primary desire was to be know, known and remembered as a child of God. That's the very first thing on this list of who I am in Christ. John 1.12, I am a child of God. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, I am a saint. Colossians 2.10, I am complete. I am secure in Christ. Not only accepted, but secure. Don't we want security? I, I turned 65 in three months. You all are supposed to go, oh, really? <laughs> and, and, and those of us who are, you know, at that ages of Social Security and, you know, Medicare and retirement somewhere down the road, isn't one of our concerns Security. Do I have what it takes to be retired? I got more than enough to live on in retirement if I die in about 48 months. <laughs> in Christ, we have that security. I'm free forever from condemnation, Romans 8.1. I'm assured that all things work together, Romans 8.28. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God, 2 Corinthians 1.21. Philippians 3.20, I'm a citizen of heaven, 2 Timothy 1.7. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me, 1 John 5.8. Security is ours. Not only am I accepted and secure, but I am significant in Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, I'm the salt and light of the earth. John 15, I'm the branch of the true vine. 1 Corinthians 3, I'm God's temple. Ephesians 2, 6, I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 3, 12, I may approach God with freedom and boldness. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. Wow, that's who you are. And if that's who we are, 
then we ought to be living a victorious life in the face of any adversity. The first priority for living this quality of life is we must be consistent. We must be consistent. I don't know if this next little story has anything to do with consistency or not, but it sure is funny. And I had to, we had to put a little laughter into today. There was an older woman who was overheard to say about her husband and their relationship together of 40 years. I, I guess that's consistent, isn't it? Been married 40 years. And she said, I am married to an archaeologist. And I get the feeling that the older I get, the better he likes me. <laughs> that is good. I don't care who you are. Uh, I certainly hope Shelley's an archaeologist. <laughs> the second part of verse 27 says, whether I come and see you, that was Paul's hope. His plan, his purpose was that I'm going to get out of prison and see you. But he didn't know what God's will would be. So, so he said, if I don't, if I don't, I want you to stand firm in my absence. Because it's not your relationship with me that counts the most. Though I have been your mentor, though I have been your discipler, it is not the relationship with me that counts. You can survive in my absence if you're consistent in your relationship with the gospel, the scriptures. Be rooted, be consistent in the scriptures. I got a, a text message yesterday. It was about 5.30. I had to leave from the reception. I had committed to a wedding months ago. It was out in the boondocks out of Selma. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The cabazes were there. I thought I'd been to about every wedding place around, but this was a new one. And, and literally, they could have played the banjo music on the road going down to where this place was. Uh, it turned out to be beautiful. It, it was a beautiful location, but peculiar. But on the way home from there, I got a text from a, a daughter of one of my mentors. Malcolm Fry is the man who preached my ordination. And um, my dad started having Malcolm come to our church in Fresno at the time every year to do a Bible conference. And every year, Malcolm would share my bedroom because we had twin beds and he didn't want to kick my parents out of their room, though they offered it, and he, he bunked with me. And this went on for almost 10 years. And uh, from my days as a 10-year-old before I announced my call to preach to when I turned 15 and started preaching, he was the first one that summer. I had been preaching since from February. I preached three sermons and he invited me to come to Arizona to preach their youth camp. I can't even drive to get there. Malcolm gave me opportunities way above my abilities and certainly way ahead of my time. But Malcolm was a significant mentor in my life. And this was his daughter who has an 18-year-old daughter. And together they were speakers at a conference and they talked about mentorship. And she said, Tim, I hope you don't mind, but I used your dad. I mean, I used my dad and you. We talked about you all weekend. And um, that text reminded me of something I hadn't thought about. Except for my dad. All the Pauls in my life are in heaven already. All the men who had mentored me in various ways Every single one of them is gone. But gone from me. And that troubled me for a moment. And then the next thing troubled me more. Because the whisper of God in my heart at that moment was, are you being to others a mentor? Like those men were to you. That's what Paul is saying here. I may not be around with you always. Malcolm is not here anymore. Jack Williams is not here anymore. Wade is not here anymore. Dan Parker is not here anymore. Uncle Delmer is not here anymore. Men who infused into my life. They put in not for it to stay here. They invested in me so that at some point we will invest in others. Paul says, hey, 
I may not be there for you to stand with me, but you, together, you stand as one. Be consistent. Be constant. A wise teacher taught his young students one time, remember the postage stamp. Do you even know what a postage stamp is? Okay, yeah, yeah, you know, we don't do that anymore. We, we send texts and emails and you don't need a stamp. So I'm sorry, have your mother explain it to you later. All right. Remember the postage stamp. It sticks to one thing until the job is done. And oh, may you and I stick to this one thing, standing together, balanced by the gospel of God's word. One of the great illustrations of a consistent life in the Old Testament is the character by the name of Daniel. Daniel was taken into captivity as just a teenager, and he lived 70 years as a captive. And if you were to take the time to read the book of Daniel, you hear it again. Daniel never wavered. Daniel continued to trust in the Lord his God. Daniel continued to pray daily. Daniel did not allow the pagan culture to change him or to reshape him. Only God was allowed to do that. And that is why Daniel could sleep with lions. It is why his three best friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, could hang out in a fire, fiery furnace and not have one hair of their head scorched or burned. They were consistent. They lived what they professed. Warren Wiersbe believes there's a lack of consistency and integrity in the church today. He said, for 20 centuries, the church has been telling the world to admit its sins, repent, and believe in the gospel. Today, in the twilight of the 20th century, the world is telling the church to face up to her sins, repent, and start being the church that God intended us to be. We Christians boast that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but perhaps the gospel of Christ should be ashamed for us. For some reasons, ministry is not always matching the message. Sheldon Van Uken in his book, A Severe Mercy, expressed a similar thought. He said the best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness. But the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians. When they are somber and joyless and faithless, when they are self-righteous and smug, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. What are the practicalities of being a consistent Christian? Three very basic things. This is not new. You have heard this before. You want to be this kind of person that Paul is talking about here? It starts. I'm I'm, going to tell you right now. This is where it starts. This is an order of priority. It starts with consistent time in reading the Bible. No shortcut, folks. You you can't read another book. You you can't get out your phone and put some earplugs in your ear and listen to somebody else. You need to be in the book. You need, you must read God. Tim, I don't don't care if you don't understand it. Okay? You need to read it. You You need to trust God to help you understand it more and more. If you read it before you show up at a Bible study or church, you might be amazed at how God will take what you didn't understand that you read last week and all of a sudden the light goes off. Boom. Wow. How did I miss that? But if you hadn't already put it here, then he doesn't have a way of getting it to here. You must read the word of God. Just as you need food and water on a daily basis, you need to be engaged in this book on a daily basis. And if you're not, you will always be a weak, anemic, stumbling, situation-controlled person on this earth. I can't say it any plainer than that. That is the reality of this life. You see, it is in the reading of the Bible that we discover more about God and about God's will. You gotta listen to his voice. Donald Gray Barnhouse, several generations ago, said 95% of knowing the will of God consists in being willing to do it before you know what it is. 
That's probably a lot truer than most of us will admit. I suspect there are some people who say, if I don't read this book, then I don't know what he wants, then I'm free. See, you'd rather, you'd rather be disobedient unknowingly than openly rebellious. Here's the deal. The end result will still be the same. You will be weak and anemic and always struggle with life. You need to be a student of the book. You must be consistent in prayer for it is in prayer that we discover more about ourselves. Our willingness to make our lives available to the needs that we share with God. God, I'm praying for so-and-so who's in the hospital. God whispers, great. I'm working through the doctors and other things. You go visit God, I'm praying for so-and-so whose family's got, great, they could use a meal. Deliver it. See, when we pray, with a knowledge of God's word already in our mind, then when we're praying, God has the ability to reveal to us more and more about ourselves. And last of all, and I, I know, so, and, and those of you who've been around here long, have I ever, ever hammered on anybody in this room about the fact you weren't in church? This is pretty brave. Have I ever once, to anybody in this room, ever said anything to you about, hey, you weren't in church the last three weeks? Never once. Probably, I never will. Now, if you bring it up, I may agree with you. But I'm never going to point it out. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You're right, you don't. But if you really are a Christian, why don't you want to go? Because God in his word says you need to hang out together. Do you realize the book of Romans to the book of Revelation was written not to individuals in a cabin on a mountaintop or in a boat out in the ocean. He wrote these to a group of people in an assembly called the church. Why? Because it's there. The Word of God is open to all of us, and together we mature and grow in faith. It is here then, when a crisis comes, like the Dean family and the Sullivan family and Dick Kelton, it is there then in this fellowship that we can be brothers and sisters in Christ together with the family of God, and we can care and nurture each other. Covey states, habits are powerful factors in our lives because they are consistent, often unconscious patterns. They constantly, daily express character and produce our effectiveness or our ineffectiveness. Next week, we'll pick up from there and we're going to look at what it means to be cooperative. Once we are consistent, we then also need to be cooperative within the fellowship with each other and this is a perfect illustration of really what communion is all about. Communion was started by Jesus as a means to remember the price that was paid for this vertical relationship with God. The elements. A piece of bread that Jesus said, this is a symbol of my body which will be broken for you. A cup with the fruit of the vine in it that Jesus says, this is a picture, it's a symbol of my blood which will be shed for you. Remember this until I come again. Remember my death until I come again. The ability to come again means he's what? Not dead, alive. Then Paul took this to another level when he wrote to the church at Corinth. And he said, before you eat this bread and before you drink this cup, examine yourselves that you and the Spirit, it's not you and your wife.